water dominates the Dutch landscape. Behind the dunes and dikes, the sea threatens inundation. But the battle with raging tides has trained the Dutch how to adapt to their environment. In the realm of architecture, water has been a powerful influence on style. From 17th century homes along Amsterdam's canals, to floating landmarks in Rotterdam, and to Elmere residential blocks with a futuristic facade. Dutch architecture is the epitome of creativity with nature as its muse. But it isn't only water that influences Dutch design. The ultimate goal is sustainability. A journey through Holland's leading structures offers a glimpse at a greener future. And that journey begins in the country's capital of modern architecture, Rotterdam. In the city's harbour, Geeselhaven, the future of sustainable architecture comes in the form of water bubbles. Uh, well, it's a floating uh, pavilion um, and it's designed as an uh, example of uh, what the possibilities are for building on the water. Most buildings here are attached to the mainland, but this one floats. We are standing now on a uh, concrete floor, uh, which is poured onto uh, two meters of um, EPS foam. Um, so yeah, more than two meters. So that is generating the uh, yeah the float. And power comes from the sun and water. The building is pretty much self-sufficient. The first successful example of Rotterdam's ambition for a climate-proof city. They try to uh, make this pavilion as uh, independent from the mainland as possible. And so it has its own water cleaning system and it has its yeah, solar power and um, uh, natural ventilation. So it is very uh, energy efficient. And not only this pavilion uses this technique, but yeah, a lot of different other buildings in, in the city and in the Netherlands as well. Spekenisse, Rotterdam. Here sustainability is hidden behind the bricks. World-renowned architect Winnie Maas designed the Buchenberg Library. The Dutch like to call it the Mountain of Books. He selected for the material, the same material as the church, as the houses. He used it for the market square here. He used it for the interior of the library. It goes up over the stairs, up to the top. All the bricks that you can see on the floor. It's very say, Dutch in a way, how that's done. And by stressing that, it gets character. And as a side effect, you get a kind of domestic feeling, as if you are in a barn. Actually, you are in a super barn. So everything is brick. This even includes the elevator. Well, sort of. Here in this case, when you can see the floor is out of real bricks, but we were not allowed to make everywhere real bricks because then the lift would be too heavy and the lift institute didn't allow us for that. So that's why I had to do this kind of uh, way. But the bricks provide more than a homey feel. Together with stone shelves, trees and wooden curtains, they serve as a heat moderator. Here is a nice part. This is for the... Uh, this is for the heating system, because the, the, the bricks they heat up and then here you can control it so that when in the winter times everything is like very nice and warm. The materials send the absorbed heat to the underground central heating and with this, who needs air conditioning? There's no air conditioning, completely natural, ven ventilated throughout the four seasons. This uh, building will act as a, almost like a lung, I could say, and as a lung for respiration. But being energy efficient is just a part of what these architects are working towards. Omer, a leading global architecture firm based in Rotterdam, 
was one of the first companies in the world to practice sustainability. I think we started already thinking about sustainability long before the rest of the world was talking about sustainability. If you think about sustainability, I think sustainability is not only a matter of energy, but sustainability is also a matter of creating buildings of high quality. Because buildings of high quality are enjoyed by people, it makes people much happier to, be, to, live, to live and work in a pleasant building. For me, the quality of the building is the way in which it stimulates the people inside to be creative. That is, that is really the essence uh, of what I'm trying to, to achieve. Rum Kohlhaas founded OMA in 1975. He's one of the most influential architects working today. He and his team redefined postmodern architecture and brought in elements of media, politics, sociology, and of course, sustainability. Basically, in all the buildings we do, we have sustainable technologies, and it's it's not that there is a single technology that makes it sustainable. It's kind of really to uh, make decisions on every level that, in the end, together, can make a building sustainable. And in Beijing, the new headquarters for China's Central Television. OMA's biggest project yet has a new way of looking at sustainability in a high-rise. What I've been doing and trying with the CCTV is to make a very large building that is not competing in terms of height and to be as tall as possible, but uh, a building that uh, offers the Chinese a kind of internal organization, CCTV, as you can see here. It's a building that actually creates a kind of space in the city. Uh, and it creates, kind of, uh, on the other side, a kind of welcoming uh, condition in the city. So it's more productive and more communal. But building a communal high-rise isn't easy. It has to include large facilities that are normally housed in low-rise buildings. It also has to efficiently combine the entire TV process. That's administration, production, broadcasting, all in a single loop of activity. So you can basically go from the broadcasting division here, you could go to the office area here and go down to the other side. So it also brings a functional way of connecting different departments within the CCTV building with each other. And I think what is very special about this building, what we incorporated in the building, is we made a public route into the building. Parallel to, let's say, all the functions that are located in the building, there is a, a, a route for uh, visitors. So you can enter the building and you can really look into film studios, you can have a look in all the making of television. We try to build buildings that are not only there for the user, but that also have a dimension of the public uh, and that enable the public to see what process uh, takes place. Rotterdam, a city which had to build itself up from the rubble of World War II, is full of buildings that speak to the public. The Buchenberg Library, Spikenisse, is one of them. It's an example of the city's turn towards modernism. It uh, used to be uh, only a small place with some houses, some church, uh, some barns, some farms, that's it. In a way, many people don't go to the library in this place. So you have to make a building where somehow you advocate the book. So that's why we made this, a, a, a building which is completely out of glass. You can, uh, so from the outside you see it, behind the glass is something happening. And, uh, and the second thing is then that you see all the books immediately. And, uh, and there's nothing hidden in, in this place because you yeah, you can see it here. It's like a, all the books are visible from the outside towards uh, the the uh, the inside, and that's that's basically we try to pull people in. We say, books are beautiful. Please read me is what this building wants to say. In the world of Dutch design, stylistic elements work hand in hand with functionality. 
the, the library is not only a, for books, but you, know, you, have, you have shops inside, you have um, uh, offices, you have even theaters, you get rentable spaces. So what we do, we put all this, this, the shops on the lowest floor behind the books. All the offices on this floor behind the books. All the rentable spaces and the theater behind the books. So everyone, and then you clad it completely with, uh, with these books to, to advertise to the exterior that we are, we are here. Crucial to sustainable design is how we look at space. And in this regard, the Dutch have an advantage. With 16 million people and a population density of 488 people per square kilometer, Netherlands is the most densely populated country in the EU and one of the most densely populated countries in the world. In Rotterdam's old harbor district of Wilhelminapier, near the world-famous Erasmus Bridge, a new skyscraper is taking shape. De Rotterdam is another groundbreaking design by OMA. When it's finished in 2013, it'll be the biggest building in Holland. This is for European standards an enormous building. It's 145,000 square meters. It's a new concept for a high-rise building, which is extremely compact. This is a type of building you see more often in uh, Hong Kong. In Hong Kong you have a lot of buildings that are actually connected to each other, high-rise buildings. But in Europe this has not been really done before. So this building actually consists of uh, three towers, and the towers are actually connected to each other. It is a kind of uh, collection of blocks on top of each other, which are shifted to it, uh, from each other. It's very dense. Uh, so they utilize the land to the maximum and because of the close adjacency of the blocks it, the blocks create also a lot of shading towards each other and therefore they can reduce the cooling load in the building substantially. So from a sustainability point of view I think this project is extremely sustainable. And crucial to is how long a structure will last. In Elmira, architect René van Zouk shows us how sustainability could just mean changing our ideas about building. Nowadays, sustainability is a lot about installations in the building. For me, sustainability has a lot to do also with the architecture, how you put things together, um, and afterwards, how you can demolish things in a good way. One of his designs is Block 16. I think we make a very expressive architecture which is based on building technique. Because of its fluid appearance, the building's been given the name The Wave. It's an example of form meeting function. This was our first uh, staffed housing project we ever did. So we looked around what is the cheapest way to make staffed housing in Holland. And the cheapest way is to use a, a tunneling casting system. That's a building system where you cast the floor and the wall in one session. And that session goes very fast, and because it goes very fast, it is very cheap. It costs just 4% more to give the building its unique shape, allowing it to look fluid, but also be versatile. What is very important is that the, the flexibility of the building. When we started this building, there were 42 apartments in it. Uh, but when they tried to sell the apartment, they couldn't sell the bigger ones. So we split the bigger ones. So in the end, we had 49 apartments in it. And if the building is flexible, that you can change it after a while, that makes it very sustainable because that also means that if the atmosphere or the number of people change, the age of the people change, they can change also the apartment. For me, the most sustainable building is the building which lasts very long. Another way to increase a structure's lifespan is make it mobile, like the floating pavilion in Rotterdam. It floats, so it's, it's like a, uh, a little bit like a ship. It doesn't have an engine, but you can push it with another ship to another location. And I think flexibility is also very uh, sustainable. The pavilion will spend five years moored in the Rheinhaven, 
There it'll serve as a climate expertise center. Afterwards, it'll move to Stotshaven's district, where 13,000 climate-proof homes will be built in the next three decades. And over a thousand of them will be built on water. Well, I think this is the future of Rotterdam. So what does the future hold for architecture? The future trend for architecture, I think uh, we need to be uh, kind of much more creative uh, in terms of uh, our relationship with existing buildings and the existing environment. There's a trend to, to hopefully to be the greenest on the planet for every city. And we try to encourage that with our books and about the green dream. We want to invent new patterns that make the city greener. And on the other hand, there will be a desire to be also more accessible, to have cities where you can travel faster from one place to the other, which leads to more density, therefore more proximity. There will be a, a trend where uh, much more on material where we see that, that material can do more that they can, uh, so that you can combine in one material ultimately strength, temperature control, electricity, water supply, uh, changeability and we call that the, 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 the transformer where, where we can make like Barba Papa buildings that can adapt to your environment. And I think that is, that is I think for us important to, to create buildings that really put as much quality as possible to an organization. It also makes that the buildings are appreciated over a much longer period. The issue is how can you modernize a building without destroying uh, its quality and while leaving its qualities intact. How can you maintain some of its qualities and still let it perform in a new way? And, and that is a, a, an issue that uh, fascinates me. In the next episode, we look at how the Dutch transform their neighborhoods for a greener future. Saving energy, saving trees. <laughs>